Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, JP and I are glad to present in this research workshop two studies on the youth who are not in employment, education, and training, as well as the training landscape in the, in the country. Uh, JP and I will be sharing the presentation. I will present to you the reasons behind the, and the design of the study. JP will present the results. Then I will come back for the conclusions and recommendations. And next slide, please. The uh, study was uh, actually, uh, as mentioned by uh, Vice President Ballesteros, conducted together with TESDA and the Philippine Business for Education or PBED uh, for their project uh, called Youth Work Philippines. Uh, we'd like to thank them for uh, asking PIDS to do this study with them. Uh, this is a very useful one. And next, uh, next slide, please. The significance of the study has been uh, outlined by uh, Vice President Ballesteros as well, uh, is that uh, emanates from the belief that uh, being not in employment or youth not being not uh, in employment, education and training can undermine their uh, uh, future uh, employment and earning prospects. Uh, leading to lasting economic disadvantage. In addition, being in EET or NEET can also have adverse social consequences such as depression, weaker uh, social engagement, and possibly de deviant behavior. Thus, having needs comes as a great cost to economy and society. Thus, it's a very important topic that has to be uh, understood well. Uh, we mentioned also earlier that there is about 3.9 million Filipino youth in January 2021, or about 16% of the youth population uh, who are in EET. So it's uh, natural to look at the question whether this is a demand or a supply issue. Uh, it would be useful to look at the profiles of the in EET, youth in EET and the reasons why they are not in employment, education, or in training. Or it is uh, a question about the training landscape. Training programs can help the youth find uh, employment, but these programs need to be responsive to the labor market demand. Next slide, please. The research question for the first study titled, Who are the youth need in the Philippines? Uh, addresses five research questions. One is, the, who are the youth need in the Philippines? What are the dropout points of learners across the education continuum? Uh, who are the uh, need, uh, uh, how are the need computed uh, and monitored across government agencies? And how many need are potential Tibet learners? And lastly, what barriers do need face in pursuing their uh, further training? Uh, we are presenting this at the same time so that it will not be uh, uh, the two studies. So it will be uh, to listen the back and forth between me and JP. So I'll just present again the study, second study, which is uh, uh, basically looking at the supply side, uh, which has this research questions. What are the existing training programs uh, for both your Philippines uh, priority sectors? and uh, how responsive are the current training programs to the industry needs and is there industry demand for uh, new uh, national certificates or INSEES? How did the COVID-19 pandemic impact training programs and what industry sectors emerged due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, so let me now uh, turn to the conceptual framework. The conceptual framework, understandably, uh, is, is, is the same for the two studies. The two studies uh, uh, deals, but dealing with different blocks of this uh, 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 conceptual framework. The conceptual framework is described in three major groups. This is the economic and training environment, uh, the intermediate outcomes, of course, and the final outcomes that you, you want to have the need to be in, in school or in training or be or employed. And uh, that, uh, Training and, uh, uh, and, and employment could give them uh, wage and income uh, 
that uh, will support them through uh, their productive lives. So uh, the figure provides uh, the comprehensive uh, uh, environment surrounding the youth needs. Uh, the activities of the youth are dependent on the underlying economic and training environment. This is the uh, leftmost uh, group of, of components. This consists of the general economic and industrial structure uh, determining the demand for, for skills. And the supply side of the training consisting of the training institutions and their course offering on the one hand, and the households deciding to educate or train uh, to be trained in the other. Government and non-government institutions tries to influence these decisions by providing programs, their own programs as well. These interactions are supposed to produce the intermediate outcomes is the middle block, uh, consisting of demands for skills and new skills supply. Uh, and these are supposed to generate the final outcome, which we, the society is interested in, uh, of youth being in training uh, or employed, and, and finally get their uh, wages and income. The first study is focused on uh, the household decisions over uh, education and training. This is component, a component of box B, uh, and the government programs is in box C. The second study, on the other hand, uh, focuses on the training institution, which is also in box B, the, the training component of box B, and as well as the program catering to the youth in box C, as well as the course offering enrollment and participation in box E. Okay, so that's, that's how the, the two studies are, are situated in uh, trying to uh, explain these blocks in, in this general conceptual framework that we have for the study. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this slide, uh, the next two slides, uh, will show you how we tried, uh, how we use data to answer the questions. To answer the research questions, who are the youth needs and what are the dropout points and how many needs are, are potential Tibet learners. We used the analysis, uh, we analyzed the uh, uh, Philippine Statistical Authority survey data, particularly the labor force survey, the family income and uh, expenditure survey and the annual poverty indicator survey to answer that question. Uh, to answer the question of how do government agencies measure and monitor the need, we, we uh, reviewed PSA documents and did interviews with relevant government offices as, as uh, mentioned in this uh, slide. And finally, to answer the question on barriers that uh, keep the youth need from pursuing Tibet, we did an online survey of TESDA and Youth Work uh, Philippines uh, trainees. That, that's how we uh, ask, uh, use data to answer the research questions. Next slide, please. For the second study, uh, we used TESDA secondary data and TESDA documents to answer the question of what are the existing training programs for Youth Work Philippine priority sectors. Uh, and we used the interviews and roundtable discussions with enterprise-based training providers to answer the next set of questions. That is, uh, how responsive are the current training programs to industry needs? Uh, particularly secondary data for, uh, is there a uh, uh, youth need, uh, a need for new national certificates? And also the in interviews on how did the COVID-19 pandemic impact the training programs and what industry sectors emerged due to the training uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Tested documents were also used to answer the question on national certificates and interviews also provide the insights of the responsiveness of the current training programs. Now, let me turn to JP for the results. So uh, we will first uh, discuss the findings of the first study, which is who are the youth need in the Philippines. First, we will discuss uh, the first part. The first part of the study is uh, an analysis of the profile of the Filipino need. So, uh, in uh, January 2021, there were an estimated 3.9 uh, million Filipino need, and this consists of 19.4 percent of, of the youth population. This is based on uh, the labor force survey, although uh, 
uh, from the October 2021 edition of the labor force survey, this proportion has already gone down to 3.9%. So in this slide, we uh, discussed the prevalence of NEET among, among uh, different subgroups, subgroups of the Filipino youth. And here we used uh, data from the uh, 2019 rounds of the labor force survey. So out of the country's 17 regions, BARM has the highest need incidence at 27%, uh, which means that 27% of youth in BARM are, are need. And uh, the BARM is followed by Davao region and Mimaropa at 20%, and Zamboanga Peninsula and Central Luzon, both at 19%. Uh, in terms of sex, females are more likely to be neat than males. So 24% of female youth are neat, compared to just 14% among male youth. And the neat incidence is even higher among females aged 20 to 24. Their neat incidence is 40%. And it's even higher among young married females, uh, for whom the neat incidence is 67%. Uh, in terms of educational attainment, 70% of youth with a lower secondary education are NEAT. Uh, NEAT. The NEAT incidence is actually lowest among youth with an upper secondary education at 9%, and it's highest among youth with uh, no educational attainment at 75%. Um, in terms of uh, geography, 19% of the, the youth, the neat incidence in rural areas is 19%, which is about the same as the neat incidence in urban areas, uh, 18%. And in terms of family income, uh, neat incidence is generally higher among youth belonging to poorer families. So we found that 23% of youth in the bottom half of the income distribution are neat, compared to just 11% among youth belonging to the top 20% of families. Okay, so here we show the profile of Filipino need. Uh, again, in we use uh, LFS data in 2019. So the overwhelming majority of them, 69%, are age 24. 53% are of them are female. 43% have a lower secondary education. Over half, 56%, live in rural areas. And 56% come from the poorest 40% of families in terms of, of income. Okay, so when we look at the economic status of need, we see that most of them are economically inactive or out of the labor force, which means that they're neither working nor looking for work. So 74% of the need are out of the labor force. Uh, and we found also that 52% of, of NEET or over half of the NEET population consists, consists of economic, economically inactive females. And among the econo economically inactive NEET, the main reason for being economically inactive is home care. So 45% of the NEET are economically inactive because uh, they are preoccupied with household or family duties. Uh, finally, over 60% of female need who are economically inactive are married. So this seems to say that uh, marriage and family formation have a lot to do with why female need are not participating in the labor force. So next, we examine uh, where the youth drop out in the education ladder and where they go when they leave school. So to answer this question, we used uh, labor force survey data to see uh, education attendance rates at different ages. So this graph on the screen uh, shows school attendance rates from ages 5 to 24. And the orange curve that you see uh, represents overall attendance rates, while the colored curves beneath the orange curve represent school attendance rates at 
different education levels from primary to, to the bachelor level. So you will see that at ages six to 12, uh, which corresponds to which corresponds to the years when children are in primary education, school attendance among children is very high, averaging at, at nine, uh, 98%. From ages 12 to 16, uh, which corresponds to junior high school, school attendance starts to fall gradually. So from 98% at age 12, it falls to 92% at age 16. And after that, it falls at a much faster rate at age at ages 17 to 19, uh, which corresponds to senior high school and the transition to college. You see here that the school attendance falls from 92% at age 16 to 63% at age 19. And then after that, school attendance falls even faster at ages uh, 20 to 21, corresponding roughly to second year to fourth year college. So from 63% at age 19, school attendance drops to 21% at age 20, 21. Uh, so from age 22, school attendance continues to fall, but at a slower pace. And at age 24, only about 7% are left in school, most of them at the bachelor level. Okay, so next we try to answer the question of where the youth go when they leave school. So when youth leave school, they can either go to the labor force, meaning be employed or unemployed, or become inactive. So when we looked at the data, we found interesting differences between males and females when they transition out of school. So the first thing we found is that young males tend to leave school earlier, while young females tend to stay longer in school. So in this graph, the curves show the proportion of youth who are still in school by sex. The blue curve represents males and the pink curve represents females. We see that at ages uh, five, 15 to 19, uh, education participation among females is higher compared to males, although that difference disappears at age 20, and after that, the gap actually reverses. Uh, the second thing we found is that males transition to work earlier and in larger proportions than females. That's shown in the graph here. So we see here that as early as age 15, 10% uh, of male youth are already employed compared to 7%. And uh, as we expect, as youth age, a uh, larger and larger share of youth become employed. But that gap between males and females persists. And if you can see beginning at age 21, that gap widen. So that at age 24, three out of four male youth are employed, but only half of the females at that age are employed. So finally, we found that when youth uh, when youth leave school, a larger share of female youth tran transition to being economically inactive compared to males. So that is shown in the graph here. So at ages uh, 15 and 16, the share of youth who are out of the labor force is basically identical for both sexes. That changes starting age 17 when a gap starts to appear and that gap continues to widen until age 24. And when youth reach that age, nearly 40% of female youth are inactive compared to just under 10% of male youth. Okay, so next, uh, in this section, we turn to the question of how government agencies measure and monitor. Well, first, we discuss the role of the Philippine Statistics Authority or the PSA in measuring the country's need population. So the PSA publishes official statistics on NEAT using data collected from the Labor Force Survey. And the LFS used to be done quarterly, but has been uh, done monthly since January 2021. Uh, so the LFS, the LFS collects data on four variables that are used to identify NEAT. These are age, employment, education participation, meaning if a person is attending school, and training participation, meaning if a person is attending a training program. 
So actually, the question on training participation was introduced in the LFS only in its July 2018 round. So from so from uh, 2006 to 2018, what the PSA only has is data on the NEE or the new youth not in employment or education, and they only started publishing data on it in in 2019, just uh, about three years ago. Okay, so uh, in our review of PSA survey manuals, we found that the way that the PSA defines training participation is quite narrow and different from the way TESDA defines training participation. So based on PSA survey materials, only people who are attending school-based event programs are considered as participating in training. Uh, for TESDA, however, TVET TVET programs can be delivered in a variety of ways. Uh, TVET can be delivered through institutions such as uh, TVIs, technical vocational institutions, uh, through enterprises such as apprenticeship or learnership programs, through community-based programs, and through so-called uh, monitored programs. These are training programs delivered by uh, government agencies. So if we take a look at the pie chart on the right, uh, based on tested data, two thirds of enrollees in TVET programs in 2019 were actually taking TVET programs outside of institutional providers. So 45% a community-based program and 18% took a, took a monitored program. So because of PSA's definition of training, because PSA's definition of training participation is narrower than TESDA's, it is possible that PSA is undercounting or underestimating the true extent of training participation in the country. Okay, so now we turn to the result of our interviews with government agencies. So we interviewed offices in uh, DOLE, TESDA, CHED, DEPED, SWD, and the NYC. Uh, specifically, we interviewed offices that run education, employment, or training programs and other programs that target the youth. Okay, so we asked uh, government offices whether they use the NEED concept, and we found that only two agencies, DOLE and TESDA, use this concept. And that's because these are the only two agencies that have programs that specifically uh, target need. For DOLE, that is the SPES, the Special Program for the Employment of Students. And according to TESDA, they seek, find, train, assess, certify, employ framework uh, targets the youth need. And we also asked government, government agencies whether they monitor need. And although all of them keep track of the beneficiaries of their program, only Dole said that they monitor need statistics from the PSA. All right, so next we discuss how we answer the question of how many need are how many need youth are potential Tibet learners. So we try to answer that question by estimating a regression model that predicts training participation using data from the PSA's labor force survey and the annual poverty indicator survey. Uh, so in this presentation, we're only going to show a simplified representation of uh, the, the methodology we used. And those who are interested in the details may refer to, to our paper. So basically what we do is estimate a uh, regression model of training participation on a subsample of youth who are not need. And this model says that training participation is influenced or determined by individual characteristics like, like uh, age, sex, and education, uh, family characteristics like family size, education of parents, uh, community characteristics, uh, such as where a person lives, whether it is urban or rural. And after estimating the model, we then apply it to a subsample of the need youth. 
to predict which among the neat youth would participate in a training based on these characteristics. So, as I said, we checked how well the model performs in predicting training participation among non-neat youth. And unfortunately, the model doesn't perform very well. Of all the training participants, it only correctly identifies 32% of them as training participants. So when we apply this model on the subsample of NEAT youth, the model predicts about 25% of NEAT or close to 1 million youth as training participants. Okay, so finally, for the first study, we discussed the barriers that keep NEAT from pursuing Tibet. So we answered this question by means of an online survey. So our target respondents were current trainees and applicants in tested technology institutes or TTIs, and current trainees and applicants in youth work in YouthWorks PH, the program of of, of, of BBED. So in terms of eligibility, anyone among these target groups were eligible to, to participate in the survey as long as they were neat at the time of their application to the program. Uh, so in terms of sampling, we uh, collected the way we collected responses is we asked TESDA and YouthWorks to advertise the survey and promote it among their constituents. And we ask them to collect as many responses as they can. So our survey is a self-selected survey, meaning anyone who was willing to participate in it could do so as long as they were eligible. And this means that our sampling method is not uh, non-random and non-probability. And uh, also that means the sample is not representative of the need population or even the need population in test that technology institutes or youth works ph and that means that our findings are not the findings of the survey are not generalizable but uh, nevertheless despite this limitation we still think that our results are informative so our survey was conducted in march 2021 and uh, the usable sample size we achieved is 1,688, and most of them, 61%, consists of trainees in Tesla Technology Institutes. Okay, so we asked uh, respondents to name factors that kept them from pursuing TVET before they applied for training, and we allowed them to name more than one factor, and uh, these were their top responses. So the top reason is financial. 48% said that the reason they didn't pursue TVET was the lack of funds for money or tuition. Lack of funds for, for uh, tuition or allowance, I mean. So that is followed by the lack of information, 13%, uh, and household or caring duties, 11%, and working or seeking work at 10%. Interestingly, 36% uh, said they didn't experience any any hindrance from pursuing Tibet, and perhaps uh, some of these people didn't pursue Tibet because it was their choice uh, not to. Okay, so we also asked respondents about uh, the types of support that they think are needed in order to encourage youth to pursue Tibet. And these are the top responses that they gave. So 58% said uh, allowance support, 56% said information on jobs, 48% uh, said tuition support, 47% said job search support, and 39% said information on TVET programs. Okay, so, so those were the findings, the main findings of the first study. Now we turn to the findings of the second study on the training landscape in the Philippines. Okay, so uh, the first part is about the available training programs in youth works, PH, priority sectors, which are construction, manufacturing, and tourism. Okay, so based on our review of the data and documents, 
We found that there are many tech talk programs in construction, tourism, and manufacturing that lead to a national certificate qualification. So as of the time that we wrote the paper, there were 43 in construction, example, carpentry, NC2, tile setting, NC2. NC2. Uh, there were 21 in tourism, for example, uh, bread and pastry, NC2. And there were 104 in manufacturing. So actually, the way we counted the training programs in manufacturing is different from the way we counted the programs in the other two sectors. But for a discussion of that, we will just refer you to our paper. So tourism-related programs are actually the most widely offered programs by training schools. So in based on test the data from 2019, 27% of all TechVoc programs that are registered to TESDA are in the tourism sector. And the other programs in the top five are metals engineering, electrical and electronics, social community development and other services, and construction. And actually tourism programs are also the most demanded by, by students. So this graph shows that 10 Tibet sectors with the highest number of graduates in 2019. Um, tourism programs account for 23% of all Tibet graduates of all ages and 30% of all Tibet graduates who are youth. And the other sectors with a high concentration of youth graduates are electrical and electronics, automotive and land transportation, metals and engineering, and ICT. So for this question and the other remaining questions, we use the responses that we gathered from our interviews with companies that run training programs. So as uh, we said earlier, we conducted the uh, informant interviews for this paper. Uh, two of the companies that were in, we interviewed were engaged in construction. Uh, one is a canning company, while the other is a hotel company. Uh, so two of these companies have an in-house training school, while the other two companies have an, an, an apprenticeship program. And most of these uh, companies employ their graduates after, after they graduate from their training. So for this uh, section of the paper, we asked respondents to talk about the issues on the responsiveness of existing training programs to industry needs. And this is the synthesis of their responses. Okay, so the first concern has to do with the low demand for construction related trainings among the youth. So the construction companies we interviewed said that they find it hard to find students for their training programs, even with the offer of free tuition and a guaranteed job after passing the assessment. And they said this is because young people don't have a favorable view of construction jobs. Uh, they find construction jobs as dirty, dangerous, difficult, and dead end. And in general, more young people prefer tourism over construction training programs. Uh, so the second issue is on the subject of allowances and government scholarships. So our respondents said that they tap government scholarships to finance their programs, for example, TESDAS, TWSP, and TESFA, and DepEd's uh, JDVP, the Joint Delivery Voucher Program. Uh, so they said that the scholarships are barely enough to cover program costs, which include trainer salaries and trainer materials. And there's also the issue of allowances. So one provider said that they tap uh, test the TWSP with free tuition, but no allowance. Uh, they said that many potential students are unwilling to undergo training because of the absence of an allowance to support them in the course of the training. So actually, TESDA already added an allowance benefit to the TWSP at the time we conducted the interview. So probably the respondent was talking about a, a previous experience. So the third issue is about the lack of soft skills among entry-level workers. So one informant said that many of their entry-level workers do not advance at work because they lack communication skills and discipline. And then another informant said that they noticed that uh, 
younger workers tend to fall short on discipline and compliance to superiors. And they also said that their jobs are relatively easy to learn and what they need are, are workers who are disciplined and willing to follow instructions. Uh, finally, there is the issue of workers leaving the company after gaining skills and some experience. Some of the respondents said that many workers leave their company to work in bigger cities or leave the country to work overseas after gaining qualifications as well as experience. And this means that these companies always need to train new workers to fill the gap left by those who, who leave the company. Okay, so next we discuss our respondents' answers to the question of whether there is demand for new national certificates or training regulations. So when we asked our respondents whether there is demand for new qualifications in their sector, only one, only one of them cited a specific area, which is uh, prefabricated construction in the construction sector. Uh, what uh, most respondents actually brought attention to is or are, are other issues surrounding uh, training regulations and and we discuss those issues here. So the first one is on the need to update uh, training regulations for existing training programs. So some respondents thought that these training regulations or TRs are not being are not up to speed with with uh, current industry practices or technologies and need to be updated. For example, one respondent claimed that TRs for some programs still prescribe the use of, of uh, outdated tools. Uh, the second is on the issue of the training of, uh, or, or of the, qual the issue of the quality of the training schools. So some informants observed that uh, some TVIs lack equipment and facilities that are up to par with industry standards, and these include PESDAS, uh, Provincial Training Centers, or PTCs. And they said that this results in graduates who lack the required skills when they when they become employed. Okay, so the next concern has to do with uh, trainers and assessors. So one of our informants believed that Trainers in TVIs tend to be not industry-based and therefore they are not up to date with the latest uh, industry practices and technologies. And then another informant suggested that TESTA should immediately accredit industry practitioners to, to become trainers and assessors and no longer require them to undergo training assess and assessment, which is the current practice. So uh, in response, TESTA said that they require prospective assessors and trainers to undergo training and assessment so that they can learn how to teach and assess, basically because they said that teaching and assessment uh, requires uh, specific skills. And uh, when we reviewed test the documents, we found that industry experience is actually already a requirement to be a trainer or assessor, although being a current industry practitioner is, is not is not a requirement. Okay, so the final concern has to do with with industry voice and dialogue between and dialogue between industry and the government. So one of our respondents suggested that there should be regular dialogue between between industry and training providers and the government so that industry can better con convey their their specific needs. Okay. So finally, uh, we discussed the responses of our informants when we asked them to uh, discuss the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on their training programs and what, and what industry sectors emerged because of COVID-19. Okay, so uh, both of the respondents that run an in-house training school said that they were forced to suspend all face-to-face -face classes due to community quarantine measures. Uh, on the other hand, two other respondents with an apprenticeship program were able to continue their apprenticeship programs because their businesses remained open, although they have had to reduce their, their apprentices to maintain social distancing and because they were working at a, at a limited capacity. 
So because uh, face-to-face classes were suspended, some of our respondents said that they converted the theory component of their training modules into videos or electronic materials that their students can access online. And this has allowed their students to, to continue learning remotely. Although the same couldn't be done for practical skills because teaching practical skills requires hands-on activities in the lab or in the workplace, which at the time of our interviews remained closed. And another, uh, another limitation of online learning is that it is hindered by the lack of access of students to the internet or to digital devices, especially students among low-income families. So when we, uh, when we asked our respondents whether the pandemic has created demand for new skills or jobs, uh, these are the jobs or skills that were mentioned. So first is uh, auxiliary nursing services. So one of our informants said that they were pi piloting an auxiliary nursing services program which produces qualified nursing assistants and their objective is to help fill demand for for nursing assistants in the in the hospitals. Uh, the next is digital skills. So some respondents mentioned uh, digital skills, especially because transactions are now shifting online and digital marketing skills can also allow uh, companies to promote their products online. And then finally, another respondent uh, mentioned the need for students to learn how to self-learn or to learn on their own. So it was said that students need to be trained to be more responsible for their own education, which becomes useful when teachers cannot be physically present, such as in a pandemic. Uh, so in terms of subsectors that have emerged due to the pandemic, only one was mentioned by any of our respondents, and that is online food selling in the hospitality, hospitality sector. And it was mentioned that Home cooking has cost advantages that make it more competitive compared to restaurants because overhead is lower and for, um, because um, and because of that, people with cooking skills can take advantage of 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 these skills and put up their their online business. Okay, so that's it for the findings. I'm now uh, turning it back to. Turning it over back to, to Dr. Arbeta. Next slide, please. So uh, I, I'll run uh, through the conclusion just to remind you about what JP has said and, and, and perhaps dwell a little bit more on the recommendation. So the first one is that uh, uh, in terms of the profile of the youth need, uh, 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 the incidence as you have, re, uh, have been is very is highest in Barm, followed by Davao region, Mimarupa, Sabonga Peninsula, and Central Luzon. Then uh, need, uh, needs are mostly female and tend to come from poorer families. And the need are need are uh, mostly economically economically inactive, with home care as being the principal reason for the inactivity. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, school attendance uh, drops out significantly uh, during ages 17 to 21, and males tend to leave school earlier and start work earlier than females. A large share of the female uh, leaving school become econ economically inactive. Next slide, please. Uh, few government uh, agencies currently use the NEET concept, and PSC's definition of training participation excludes non-school-based modes of delivery, uh, likely undercounting the training participants. Next slide, please. Uh, when we uh, try to predict uh, how many of these uh, new needs uh, using a model, uh, and we uh, there are problems with the model, but if, if the model predicts 25% of the needs will are potentially to be learners or about one, 1 million youth. And, and we should be uh, taking these results uh, because of the uh, issues with the model and perhaps we can improve the model with better data next time. Next slide, please. Uh, 
the third brief also found that the financial constraints uh, is, is mentioned as the main barriers for pursuing uh, that prevents uh, needs from pursuing Tibet, uh, followed by lack of information and housework, uh, financial support, including tuition allowance, and information on jobs and Tibet programs can help uh, also encourage Chinese to participation among the youth and the survey findings, uh, however, it's not generalizable because we didn't do a probability sampling. It was impossible during that time. We didn't have a, a, a frame, uh, but uh, these are uh, informative as well, uh, nonetheless. So in terms of recommendation, uh, we we thought that uh, we should uh, do more in-depth studies on determinants of the youth needs. Uh, I, uh, for instance, why are uh, female going into inactivity when they leave training or uh, school? Uh, and uh, that that's one issue that has to be. Uh, you, you need to find a good data on, on why, uh, and and identify the policies that will draw them into either training if the uh, if they don't don't continue with a regular school, maybe they can go into training, but that they don't do that or or employed. Then what can keep them employed? Is us. So those are issues that has to be uh, uh, stressed out and with better data. And then so and 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 because most as we have said, while males go to work, females don't. Uh, they just when they leave school, they become economically inactive. Neither. Uh, they don't pursue training nor, nor did they work. So that's essentially uh, a, the issue with uh, females who leave school. Okay, uh, and uh, PSCN test that has should need to resolve uh, needs to resolve the difference in definition about training participation because as of now uh, as we have uh, JP has mentioned that the current definition of PSA. Uh, uh, undercounts the number of those who are in training by about almost 45 percent because these are not they don't count those who are not trained in 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 uh, in uh, in universities or or uh, and uh, and uh, community-based training programs these are big uh, components of of uh, tested training so that's that's one thing that has to be resolved and uh, uh, we need to promote the uh, need concept among the relevant government agencies because that's, that's as, as we have mentioned at the beginning, this is a big cost of society for uh, our youth not to be in either training or employment uh, and be and being active. So encourage also the participation uh, uh, through financial support, which we have been doing, and maybe we should uh, information dissemination and employment facilitation assistance. These are the things that are mentioned by those who are saying that uh, uh, why they were not able to pursue the training. So that, these are what has been mentioned. Yeah, we know that we have been doing a lot of financial support uh, for, uh, so perhaps we should uh, do a little bit of nuance, nuancing where we should be putting our money so that we can improve uh, participation and training for our youth who are not in training, education, uh, or uh, in employment. Next slide, please. So for the second study, there are uh, uh, the uh, Tibet trainings are in tourism as, as, as the biggest construction and manufacturing leading to a national certificate. Uh, and that the industry concerns are about lack of demand of certain training, especially for construction. As this had said, uh, financing is not uh, enough in the, the construction industry. Uh, because there are already programs for construction, but they are still uh, low take care. So there needs to be more, more things to be done to, to be uh, uh, done in order to improve the demand for for training for construction. Uh, train, uh, for construction. Uh, the other thing that is mentioned is uh, up to dateness of trainees, assessors, and training schools, and training curricula to the industry practices. So the, basically, this is based more uh, synchronization between industry and the training uh, institutions so that they will be uh, uh, updating each other on what's needed by 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 the firms uh, the other thing important as mentioned is the inadequate skills among the even if uh, we are training for skills communications is very important work uh, attitudes and uh, discipline are very important as well so those kinds of uh, have to be uh, given importance besides the skill itself of, of, of 
uh, uh, whatever they are being trained for. So this uh, people call this transversal skills that needs to be uh, inculcated as well together with the skills. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Rather than a new insist, uh, it appears that the, the, the need is for updating training regulations, improving the quality of training schools, and tapping industry practitioners as trainers and successors to basically solve the problem of uh, 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 lack of sync, synchronization between training in, 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 and, and, and practice, and enhancing the industry dialogue. I think there is a, already a move of the uh, industry boards at, at the local levels that will perhaps be a venue for all of this uh, dialogue that will uh, improve the synchronization between training institutes and, 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 and firms. The COVID-19 has forced some to shift uh, uh, to uh, online training, but it's effectively limited by lack of practical training and lack of internet services. That's basically uh, one of the problems that uh, throughout the education sector that we have data for. Uh, that uh, lack of uh, uh, connections in in households is the one that prevents us from 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 uh, pushing really online training. Even if we are capable, if our schools are capable, our households are not appears to be prepared from the data that we we we, we can find. Pandemic has created demand for nursing assistance and digital skills and boosted online counseling. For the last slide, uh, next slide, please, is for recommendations. Uh, the pursuit of information campaigns for to improve the image of construction jobs, and that's, as I have said, you already have financing for that, but there are no, no takers, so there, there needs to be something else that has to be done besides financing for construction. Review the content of training in view of the strengthening of soft skills and formation. So that's, that's, that's the other thing that has to be emphasized. So it's not just the dexterity of the hand on things that we do, but also the agility the preparedness of the mind and the attitudes towards work and and, and communicating what 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 we want to do what they need for instance is the other thing that perhaps the employers are looking for and top industry practitioners practitioners as trainers and assessors and pro to promote uh, exposure of school based trainers and assessors to industry practices so the basically the greater synchronization between schools and and firms invest in flexible learning training modalities yeah uh, uh, for training providers with due consideration of the access to limitations of target training. So uh, uh, some can be done in flexible online learning, but we have to understand that there are limitations from our client side that we have to understand. Even if our schools are prepared, maybe our client is not. So we have to bridge that, that gap. Uh, there are many examples for it, like for example, PBED has experimented on lending tablets to trainees. Uh, uh, because uh, during the time of the pandemic, and that's the only way they, can, they were able to participate and providing them loads to be able to access. And pro finally, promote regular dialogue between, this is always a, a very, uh, in terms of, because of the rapid change in technology, uh, there should be always a, a con conversation between employers and, 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 and trainers and government uh, and trying to know how to help that conversation to, to continue. And, and so that the synchronization between training institutions and and and, and firms is 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 is, is, is always high and and and, and be uh, 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 helping each other uh, provide the needs of of the industry. I think that's the last uh, recommendation, JP. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.